Hi, Sharon. So this is wonderful to sit down with you today. Um, I'm so excited to speak to you about your work in the exhibition and, and the broader project from which uh, this, this series is, is taken that we're using the exhibition. So the, the excerpt or the body of work that we're using is from your larger series, uh, Toxic Tour of Texas. And what I'd love to do is just start off speaking about the kind of origins of the project. So you started working on this with a journalist. Is that how this project started? Well, it's interesting to go back a bit. Steven Finberg, that was my collaborator, he actually wanted to become a writer. He had left his life as a jeweler and wanted to have more purpose uh, in his life. So he set out to uh, pursue a writing career. We were friends and he obviously knew I was a photographer and he had this idea and he asked if I would come along and photograph. So it as we go through this today, I think we'll understand how this project evolved. Uh, and it was a very interesting journey for me to figure out how to make these photographs of service, of use, of witness, if you will. Wow. What had you been doing prior to this project? I mean, um, had you been working on a similar topic or? No, I hadn't. And, th and that's what's interesting about how this truly gave, it opened me up creatively and in an activist way. I would say I was pursuing photography as self-examination, if you will. So there was looking at the landscape that I grew up in. I've always been very interested in landscape, looking at issues, interestingly, of light, looking at issues of sexuality. So beauty was always a big piece of that, but there never really was a greater purpose, if I could say. I think it was part of my journey to have these inquiries into self and use my, my camera as the companion to that inquiry. So you heard that Stephen was doing this project and you thought, yeah, I, I, I mentioned that topic or? No, no, no. He approached me as friends. Okay. He approached me yeah. and said, this is what I'd like to do. What do you think? And, and we both had the you know, the interest in uh, what was going on in terms of our environmental dilemma, if you want to call it that. And we were interested in speaking to people who were salt of the earth, uh, people, mostly rural folks, that had a great tie to the land and were very upset about what was happening in their communities. And so at what point did it become a project for you? Well, um, if I could back up a bit, Stephen and I actually attended a legislative strategy meeting of these grassroots environmental organizations. And it was, it had the acronym People Organized to Win Environmental Rights. And basically they wanted to go to the Texas legislature and say, we need better regulation of these industries that are producing, uh, be it radioactive waste or hazardous waste from, <clears throat> excuse me, the oil and gas industry. So we approached them, told them our idea, and we said, if you're interested in telling your story, we'd like to come interview you and photograph your community and what you're facing. And some folks went ahead and said, yes, we'd like to do that. So we set across together across the state and actually ended up interviewing and photographing in six different communities. So again, as I'm, you know, as I talk about this, it, it lays itself out and, you know, the old word is organic fashion, but that mm -hmm. really is true to this. Wow. Um, so Stephen ultimately wanted to write an op-ed for one of the dailies in Houston, which is where we lived. And um, he did that for Earth Day and the Houston Post, now defunct, carried it, uh, carried his op-ed. And I said to him to answer your question, you know, Stephen, I think we can go, I can go farther with this. He felt complete. So I asked him if that would be okay. And he agreed. He thought it was a you know, really good project to continue pursuing photographically. So how did you conceptualize the project and kind of organize it when you set out to, to, to do that? Um, um, did you have a sense from the beginning, I wanna to go to these particular areas and this is how I want, I want it to function? Cause it's really interesting how you integrate um, interviews and these kind of oral histories and your, all the, the people that you're working with, your guides. So you had a real sense of, of how this project was formed or, or in the end, it seems like the project had this kind of overarching idea, but maybe that's organic too. It definitely was organic because what I realized, Stephen and I would go into these communities and we would sit down with the, the people 
And as I call them, the guides, because tours have guides. So that's where that term is derived. And I, I, I wouldn't take my cameras out. We would just sit there and listen to their stories. As they were telling us what was going on in the community, um, I would you know, take note in my head and say, later after we were finished, can you take me to this site? Can you show me you know, what the ill effects are that you've experienced here in the community because of the presence of industry? Um, but it was also important, and Stephen and I did this, to to interview the industrial representatives because we wanted to have a balanced story. I think it's clear of what my perspective is on this issue. Um, and I think we've learned over the years uh, that we journalists used to have to be totally neutral. And I think we've come to a point where we understand that a point of view is certainly very important and it's okay to really point out the different perspectives, but also have your own idea about how this should be presented, as it were. Um, so we interviewed industry people. We thought that was important and they took us on site. Uh, and then we also thought it was important to interview the, the other piece of the dynamic is the regulatory agencies. And so we interviewed those folks as well. And my point in juxtaposing the, the the quotes that were drawn from these oral histories is to show that very complex dynamic of perception about, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Of course, it's always both. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to personalize the issue. I wanted to show how this was affecting people, how it was affecting their lives and create an empathic response in viewers. And also to use these images uh, in legislative testimony um, to, uh, provide them to these small communities if they had fundraising newsletters, that kind of thing. So it was important to really expand my role as just a photographer of, of beauty, if you will, into an activist stance. And it, it just burst open my world. It was fabulous to let go of the precious object. So going back to the, the organization of it, how did you start like where did you say okay this i'm gonna do this region and i'm gonna do this group of people so you talked about the industry representatives and the activists how did you organize it in terms of different sites of environmental damage certainly well it again was a response to those who responded and as it broke down uh, makita it was uh in texas there is the full uranium cycle so it's mined it's milled it's processed um it's used for, <laughs> for the building of nuclear weapons, and those are assembled uh, in Texas. And then there was a whole waste disposal issue. So we, that was one piece in terms of who responded. Okay, again, this was very, uh, you know, I keep using the word dynamic because I think that's important. I didn't come with a, a previously set idea of how exactly I wanted to do this. Okay. It was really more responding to conversations and what I was seeing and then coming home and taking the overview and saying, what's missing? So the other piece of what Stephen and I first responded to, there were six communities and it was broken down into the, the, the uranium cycle, as well as the oil and gas industry, which is, we know, Texas, huge. So after Stephen gave me the, um, you know, the blessing, if you will, to go ahead and, and pursue more, then I stepped back and said, okay, geographically, how can I balance this story? Uh, we always, already had the issue of environmental racism quite up front and present in, in the story, but I wanted to pursue that more. And what I brought into it was uh, the issue of, of individual action, what we do as consumers, what happens from our life of consumption, the convenience of consumption, Stephen's phrase, the consumption of convenience. So um, that was important to me to balance it out geographically and then add in that third issue. At each of so. these places where you're making a lot of photographs, it's really interesting that each image feels very intentional so I'm curious about, you know, what those portrait sittings were like or what those moments of making were like for you, if you can recall. Right. Um, I don't tend to take a lot of photographs, although the, the digital realm has changed that a good bit. 
Uh, but no, I really did formulate the the images in my head. So from what I was hearing from from these these folks. So again, in terms of my creative process, I think it's very important to be curious, to be open to you know the phrase is to not know, and really to be to to be brought into uh, the situation by the interaction with others and what their lives are, not what I want to overlay on their lives, but what they're willing to reveal to me. So that on those many levels, you know, the, the industry folks did that for me, uh, not so much the regulatory people, but certainly the activists and just seeing them in their, in their communities, in their every day. Um, because I wanted to, to bring the personal into this Makita and, because we have statistics, we have reports, we've become a bit inured to, you know, the catastrophic beauty sometimes of what's going on. So I really wanted to make it very concise and uh, keep that again by using the words of the people and showing that dynamic and keeping it very um, minimal because I watched people look at the exhibition and they were actually reading it, reading the text. And that, that was good. I didn't want to overwhelm them, but I did want to, to really come in and bring that, that experiential aspect to the issue. Can you tell us about some of these installations that you had, that you did of oh, the work? Yeah. Well, that was the other thing that was quite freeing and sort of burst open for me was the Texas Humanities Resource Center and uh, which is a state agency, and then the Texas Photographic Society co-sponsored a nine-year exhibition tour of the tour. And so it was, in that way, it was really reaching, I think, down a number of levels. It was uh, in community centers, it was in public libraries, it was in um, uh, some small college galleries and some small regional museums. So there was that aspect of it. I also did a storyboard uh, presentation of this, and that's when it was shown at the state capitol in the big rotunda on Earth Day twice. Um, so that was one aspect. I also used that when it was shown at the um, Oil and Chemical Atomic Workers Union meeting at a meeting of physicians for social responsibility, the meeting of Dominican sisters. I mean, there were all these, you know, these different ways for the piece to be experienced. And then I, you know, I was asked to present it at the Society for Photographic Education. It was in the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. It was in the New Orleans Museum of Art. It's now going to be in your museum. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, um, <laughs> You know, it really has given me more purpose and more depth in the work that I've done. And, and it put me on a path to using my images to serve history. Was the, the, the different ways in which the series has been installed, these different venues, was that also part of the bursting open of kind of revealing to you the ways in which photography can kind of operate out in the world or your photographs could operate out in the world? Absolutely. And, and, you know, this is a 30 year old project, as we know, and we've seen that come to fore and I'm so very happy. But back when I was doing it, I had photographer friends say, oh, I'm so glad you're doing that for, you know, for the betterment of a situation. Um, and it, it it's tremendously exciting to me to see the activist stance of art these days. Yeah, you know, we need it. And, and here we are at this moment. It's great. What did your subjects think of the photographs and maybe of their quotes as well? Like, did they, they come to the shows, the exhibitions? Did you share with them what you were making? Oh, um, I, I guess I'm especially interested in, in the industry leaders. Like, what did they think of being in dialogue in this way and, and um, of the exhibition? Well, it's interesting. I have no idea. I mean, I, I figure I was on the radar. We didn't really have the internet back then for easy access to see what I was doing. But the, I did a self-published piece, and that was distributed throughout the environmental press and to some of the representatives. I had an alliance with a progressive publication in um, in Texas called the Texas Observer. And then the Sierra Club and, and uh, Clean Water Action did some fundraising. So a thousand extra issues of that 
a particular environmental issue could be distributed. Um, one of the reactions or the responses at the Texas State Capitol was my photographs were torn off the boards. So some people weren't, <laughs> you know, weren't very happy. But you can't, one, one really can't worry about that too much. Right. So going back to the people, though, they appreciated it. They were very glad that there was visual, tangible evidence of what was going on, and they could use those images. And that's, you know, I made them greatly available. You know, back to the preciousness, I remember going to one of these meetings, and I was holding my little box of prints in an archival, you know, a case and they said what's in that box you keep carrying around I said oh they're my photographs <laughs> and they said well maybe we see them and I said okay and again another one of those freeing moments was there they were you know handling all my prints getting their fingers all over them and you know what resulted in that particular meeting was the governor of the uh, she was a candidate at that point Ann Richards her environmental advisory wing of her campaign asked if they could use those photos so, you know, that was a very good thing. So there, I would say the reception on the level of the people that I was representing in terms of uh, their actions was very good. Mm -hmm. Don't know about the regulatory people. I think maybe the industry people weren't real happy, but we weren't either with what they were doing. So uh, just for the sake of um, the transcript and for the, the readers and viewers, can you just um, say something, you know, um, uh, my project is called Toxic Tour of Texas. I did it between these years. This is kind of the scope of it. Just some descriptor, um, just for the transcript and for people watching. Well, sure. Um, I can start over and introduce myself. How's that? Yeah. Um, okay. I'm Sharon Stewart, and I produced a project entitled The Toxic Tour of Texas uh, between the years of 1988 and 1992. Uh, I worked with writer Stephen Finberg initially and continued the project after he uh, completed his portion of it, which was to write an op-ed for an Earth Day um, piece in the Houston Chronicle. And uh, Stephen and I toured the state after talking to a group of environmental activists called People United to Win Environmental Rights. Um, we interviewed activists, actually just grassroots salt of the earth people who were addressing issues of uh, toxic waste disposal and cre creation and disposal in the state. We went throughout Texas on several trips. Uh, Texas is a large state, so sometimes we went as far as 700 miles. Uh, we talked to people in the communities who were affected by these policies and actions of corporations. We also talked to industry representatives and we talked to the regulatory folks with the state. Um, the work was used uh, in many, many different forms. It was used in legislative hearings. It was used in small newsletters of these activist organizations. It was used um, in exhibitions in the state capitol or in public libraries or uh, even a shopping center which I thought was great because I think it had the most eyes that uh, came across to see. The idea of the project was to, to bring this issue to fore in a very personal manner by the people who were being affected. And I thought it best that the photographs that were made could give this tangible evidence to what was going on. And combining that with the words of the people who were affected, um, I think brought much more power to the issue. I want to go back to, you keep using the word talking about freeing. Um, <laughs> and so how did this project, you know, how did it relate to work that you had been doing? Like, were you doing more traditional work and did, did you have more of a, a sense of the photograph as the fine print in the gallery space? And that's, that's how it functioned. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly, what, what was the freeing? What, what was something that re, about this project that made you, you know, change how you thought about yourself as a photographer or, or what a photograph was supposed to do or what, how it was supposed to operate or look, its aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious about this, about, uh, this idea that, that this project freed you. Well, I, up to that, the point of making the images for the Toxic Tour of Texas, I had definitely been involved in landscape work and I had been involved in, as I was saying, 
personal exploration um, and used the camera as my companion to those inquiries. And yes, I exhibited in uh, more in small spaces, uh, the Houston Center for Photography. Um, and when I started this work with Stephen, I just realized the power of the photographs as evidence to what was going on that it, it went beyond me. And I suppose that was the, the biggest uh, breakthrough uh, that I could use my talents and my gifts to help others and to be of service to others. And that's, a, that's a, uh, something of, of my family line that the being of help to others. So I found my way to do that. Um, and it was, yes, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, edifying to see that I could uh, be received in a different manner than, and my, um, you know, my need to, to put myself first shifted and it just became much more important, important to be a, of a greater commitment to our life here on earth. To think about particular images. So, so this, there was this moment of you understanding photography, you knew it yourself as a photographer. What was it like to make some of these images? What were kind of the challenges? I mean, I love this portrait um, of Leela. Um, oh, <laughs> her name is Lely Saponic and she's- Lely Saponic, yeah. Lely I Saponic. love that that image because it it is, you know, it's a portrait, but then you have so much space around her that it, there's this interesting way in which the background really becomes part of the story. Mm -hmm. And then the, the way in which the child is reaching for that bottle and then her quote and her gaze. Can you just talk about your approach to making these portraits that these people are not to be pitied. They're not victims. They're not, um, they're not martyrs, but they, they, you kind of humanize them. And I'm just interested in, in your process of approaching it. You said that you would go visit them first and then come back. Um, but the actual kind of framing and thinking about the construction of the image, do you, can you offer any, any thoughts on that? Well, you know, again, it goes back to just being with them and not setting anything up. And just, we were sitting on her screened in porch on her fifth generation family's land. And uh, she had, I think eight kids. So there was a baby that needed tending and she talked about the contamination of their well water. And I thought, perfect. Uh, let's, the setup was, let's get a glass of water, but just show her in her home in her every day. I mean, that's, I, that's why I wanted to, you know, bring it down to that very, very personal level. So people could relate to what it's like to have this happening if this was happening to me. You know, this is, you know, this is very similar to a situation that, that I live in or that my aunts or my grandparents live in. Um, so that, again, it was taking it back to the, the person, you know, how very important that was. Yeah, you know, that was just the setting. But again, when I, I photographed the cultural landscape, I didn't really say that in my introduction, but it's, it's really how we live with the land, how we're influenced by the land, how we try to, you know, uh, impress our needs on the land. You know, this whole idea that humans have dominion over. Well, I choose to, to see that word as stewardship, not as ruling over, but taking care of. Wow, was that something that this project really emphasized for you or, or, or clarified for you? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, my heartbreak was, Makita, I, I studied, I got a degree in finance and economics and I went on into graduate business school and I quickly saw that these aren't the people that I really wanna be spending the rest of my life with. And I come from a long line of photographers, actually. I had a great, great aunt who was a photographer with another woman and had a studio in Iowa, Quaker, they were Quakers. And these two women had their own business in the 1890s, I guess. Um, and so that was, and it had always been a passion of mine. I'd always been around cameras. Uh, and I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to, I'm going to go do this. That business background helped me really understand motivations and how, you know, we got into the mess we're in because of profit. I mean, I was taught in business school, it's the bottom line that matters. 
And I, I think with you, how you're approaching this exhibition of Devour the Earth is how the Earth has actually been subsidizing industry for all these years. That's a factor that hasn't been brought into um, the calculation, if you will. Okay. And then you have people's health. You have a uh, loss of productive land. You have all these issues that aren't in the traditional business model. Um, and I saw... I took great issue with that. You know, the other piece, it's interesting about when I talked that the, my photography has been a self-exploration, I can't help but think that my exposure in the dark room, you know, which is a womb of sorts, um, was I, I really became sickened by working with color chemistry, cibachrome chemistry. Interesting. Yeah. My mother also smoked. I was in her womb. So I just wonder, I, I just have had to wonder if that was sort of this natural progression for me to really look at the greater sustaining environment of living. Um, and it made sense to me at, finally at one point. That's really beautiful. Um, but also I've, I've heard this before that photographers, I mean, you're working in a moment in the 1980s where color is you know, coming into more use, but then there's also this growing awareness around the chemicals of photography. Um, I think there was a book published about this around this time, a photographer's account of, of um, you know, you know, the dangers of chemistry. <laughs> and and cibachrome is a horribly um, dangerous um, yeah. process to be using. Mm -hmm. And I was just inhaling it. I, you know, I ended up from this teaching courses on how to protect yourself in the dark room. You know, when I was talking to future teachers, I said, you're liable for your student's health. You know, the, the rules and regs have come down uh, and that's part of what has resulted from the activism of these folks that I covered. It's like, we need more regulation. We don't need less regulation, but unfortunately we get to a point where, oh, this is really bad. Here we are with global warming. When this project started, James Hansen had talked to Congress and said, you know, there is a human effect on what's going on with our climate. And here we are, how many years later, and, and finally we have an administration that's addressing it because people are feeling it directly. So to, to, to take the long view, which businesses don't do, they think about short-term profits, right? So I was trying to impress upon my colleagues that we really have to see that maybe this is okay now but there are long-term consequences. I'm so intrigued by what you're saying. That I'm like, you're, you're really articulating just a lot of new ideas. Um, you know, the connection between, you know, the photographer's chemical exposure. I mean, photography is a chemical medium and then photography has contributed to these, the production of these chemicals, these mass chemicals, right? Um, and so these connections of photography are really profound. Well, when I had my light work uh, residency and that, that Jeff Hoon called me up and said, you know, we have these, you know, residencies. So I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, we want to support your work. And I said, well, how? And then he told me. And um, so I went up to Syracuse and they actually helped me make the template for the text and image that ultimately was used for the exhibition prints. And I probably couldn't have done that on my own. And so that was a great, a great development. Uh, but I went over to Kodak, you know, and I wanted, <laughs> and I wanted to, you know, I was talking to a lot of public information officers. I mean, that's their job is to present the face to quote unquote the press. And uh, he, this guy was very leery of me. And I said, I'm just curious, you know, what, what you're doing to take responsibility for what you're producing and how it's disposed of. And he really didn't have an answer. Now, you know, I also wonder what container companies are doing to address, you know, the overuse of plastics and, you know, how can we, how can we get this balanced? So we have to look at, again, consequences and, and the fact that if you're going to make money, then you have, in my opinion, a responsibility to care for your consumer, the productive environment, uh, and awareness of what what these products are leading to. Is that something you're getting at with these quotes by the industry leaders, the kind of lack of responsibility? Or the... <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, they were just saying what they were saying. It was their presentation, so certainly. That's what I talk about in that dynamic 
perception. You know, it's very complex. And they really didn't think they were doing anything wrong because they were making money, because they were giving jobs, you know, to the community. And that was one of those pieces that was tough with folks in these small communities. These are your neighbors, your family members. Are you going to take away my job because you're asking for accountability? So, yeah, I, I certainly played on that in terms of what I saw as a callousness towards the, uh, the effects of their practices. Uh, and yeah, there's also a bit of irony when you look at, at how the regulatory people responded. You know, the woman Laley that we were speaking of earlier, you know, said somebody with a, she didn't say it this way, but somebody with a conscience in a state regulatory commission called and had seen the results of their well test. They said, don't drink that water. And then the, the guy I interviewed said, oh, I can't imagine anybody from our office calling her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the other thing you need is people of conscience. You know, if we can call them whistleblowers, that's the next level, perhaps. But those are very, very, very important. Had you always thought that the piece would include text? And then um, my related question um, is, you know, was there, um, I know it was organically kind of evolving, but was there an image that you particularly thought, you know, wow, I'm onto something. Like, I, like this is this is a really important image that I'm making. So maybe two questions: an important image, and then also, did you always think of them as text and image together? Well, it started out as as you know, the old w school is that you have an image illustrating the words, right? Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was one of those moments. I remember Stephen and I were having breakfast. We were wrapping up, you know, one of our visits. And through this, it occurred to me from the interviews that we were doing, what the power of the words would hold to accompany the images, not necessarily to define the images, right? But to, you know, I call this a photo narrative. And that's exactly what it is. Little did I know at the time, Makita, that this was a, an issue that text and image would be used together. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> It's an issue, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and actually, I ended up talking to NYU's, um, oh, they had the graduate program, remember, in the summers. And so one of their focuses one summer was text and image, image text. And so they asked me to come speak to, to the students. But, it, you know, I didn't go to school in photography. I didn't go to art school. I am you know, entirely self-taught and maybe whatever genetically passed down, but uh, I wasn't aware of these particular considerations. It was just, this is what needs to be done to, um, you know, to get the word out. And there was never, a, you know, a, um, a university publication, we could call it, uh, of this, because when I made my self-produced publication, we needed to get the, the word out. I didn't have two years. Right. And so that, again, made it this more utilitarian um, project. And, you know, it, it's had, you know, many incarnations and it lives on through you. I appreciate it. You said you were self-taught, but were there photographers that you were looking at or were there kinds of photographs that you were inspired by? Not particularly. That's, an, that's interesting. Uh, I can, yes, I can say who I was attracted to when I was starting out as a photographer. And it goes back to the beauty piece. We can talk minor white. We can talk seedlets. Yes, Dorothea Lange for her activism, I could say that was an influence. Imogene Cunningham, uh, you know, we can, we can move it on up to my being invited into the Water in the West project because of what I did. And it, it was sort of the reverse. They were interested in what I was doing because of the activist piece. And they were looking to find a way to make their photographs of use, examining this issue of water in the West and the scarcity of it and the use and abuse of it. So, um, the influence question is always interesting. I mean, I could say Alexander Calder. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, I know it, it is true. I mean, I think when I started making photographs, I had seen like an exhibition of these photographs by Brian Lanker, mm -hmm. but I was reading a lot of Studs Terkel and I was just thinking, Great. you know, how could I just make images that are as complex as these words? So it is true that the influence, like, what does that mean? Like, it's not always an image that you're looking about, thinking about. It is, it's literature, it's, yeah. it's you know, visual worlds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And again, I, I think, you know, I grew up in a small town. Um, relationships are very important to me. And yes. 
Um, so, and the projects that I do, I call, you know, long form photography because I develop relationships with these people. Right. And the project that I'm, I've done in New Mexico, well, there are two, but one was about this very ancient water delivery system called Asequias. And it's a huge, deep part of the culture. Here. Can you just spell that so we can look it, up later? Sure. A-C-E-Q-U-I-A. -E Asequia. And it uh -huh. goes all the way back to the Indus Valley. Okay, so five to 10,000 years. So it comes from arid farming, farming necessity. We need water, we need to deliver it. Uh, not ne necessarily to cache it, although over in Northern Africa, they, did, they do have these big underground urns that hold water. But it's all without mechanization. It's all depends on gravity flow and human ingenuity to move that water across the landscape. Uh, and I turned to that because I really wanted to focus on something uh, more positive, perhaps, of uh, people working together. The Asekia system is about cooperation, it's communal, and it's not about money. It's about, um, you know, they here people view water as a, as a resource, not as a commodity. Mm -hmm. And it's, as I said, it's communal and there's something that was very uplifting about that. And uh, it helped me because doing this project was tough, the toxic tour mm -hmm. on me. And I left, I left the city, I left the state. I came out to New Mexico to live in the face of nature. Which was is, it difficult for you just to, to realize the scale of the problem and, and what was not happening or what? So many things. What we do to one another in the name of profit was the big one our inability to see the long-term uh, type of blindness, you know, to really seeing consequences, the inability to take personal responsibility. You know, we are all complicit in this issue. Our population from the time I started this was about 5.2 billion and we're now at 7.9 billion. And yes, we're better about kind of handling our resources. You know, water, water usage in say Albuquerque, a huge city in New Mexico, huge for New Mexico, per capita water use has gone down, but there are just so many more people. And so we really do have to look at that. And and I don't know what it is about human beings that we, we can't see many of us can't see the long, long view. And we need to, we need to. Or as you're, as you're pointing out other models, right? That, that there's another model for it too. Yeah, <laughs> sure. And those solutions are coming forth and thank goodness for the people who are just staying, you know, strong with it. And I don't know if you had an opportunity to read the, the back piece of the toxic tour, which is about motivations and strategies. And, you know, that was, really made as a primer for other people who are facing these issues. How do I go about, you know, going to a legislative hearing? How do I talk to my representative? How do I hold people accountable? Uh, and that was, you know, that was the final piece of the toxic tour when we talk about its organic, you know, life is that, uh, yes, it was important to have the images and to have the voices, but then, but then what can we make this, you know, of, of more use so people can refer to this and say, okay, now I have a little bit of a guide book on how to move forward and people they could contact, you know. Which brings me to the, the project's current kind of um, living space today, which is at which university again? The, the, the... The, the Southwest Collection, which is, you know, I find that, that my work really has fallen more into the humanities realm. Uh, and I'm great with that because it is about humans. <laughs> uh, and that's what I mean by it, sort of blowing it open, expanding. So yes, in the artistic realm, but also in the humanities realm. So the Center for, um, excuse me, the Southwest Collection is at Texas Tech University. And so they, uh, they approached me and said, we'd like to have your archive. Uh, it took some negotiation. You know, they have very, some of Barry Lopez's archives there. Um, they have other regional writers, everything from Max Evans to, you know, music from Lubbock, Texas is where this is uh, based. And there's, you know, we've heard of uh, many, many musicians that have come out of Lubbock. So they're focused on that. I think it's a good it's a good repository for those archives because I wanted it to be in Texas, um, that being the subject. Uh, but as we know, this is a universal issue. So I'm happy that it's, it's more broadly in the world as well. Yeah, no, it's, it's great that it lives on as a model in of itself now. There is this 
that there's a space to look at it. Absolutely. And I've, I've had students contact me and interview me and look in the archives and uh, they can reproduce those images as long as they aren't for commercial purposes. Um, but again, that's part of the purpose of my work and what I've done a good bit is, is look to various archives that are the appropriate uh, repository for the work that I've done. Uh, some artists want to have it all in one place, but because I've had these very diverse, you know, approaches to my work, I've uh, I've placed it in the, the Ezequiel work is at the Center for Southwest Research at the University of New Mexico. It's also at the New Mexico Museum of Art and the New Mexico History Museum and those kinds of things. So it's um, again, you know, it's let's find the most appropriate place for this to be. I'm excited about the exhibition and I hope there's an opening because there, if there is, I will come and it'll be somewhat of a, a reunion because I studied economics one summer at Harvard. And what year was that? 75. It's hard to believe it's been so long. So that'll be fun to come back to campus. And um, and I uh, I'm curious where your idea you know, was, oh, how this how this came about for me? Yeah. Well, two ways. Um, my mother is an organic farmer, oh. and in the 1980s, she had a health crisis mm -hmm. and kind of realized that organic farming was something she wanted to do and would help her. And the connection between food and, and health and our exposure to the natural world, how important that was. And she started one of the first prison gardens in the country, working with prisoners. She had no kind of training. She just kind of said, let's go outside. She read The Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> At the time, she was very ill, and uh, her boss said, well, you're not going to live, so sure, take them outside. Um, and uh, she true. lived and um, created this program. But so I, I've kind of grown up, you know, with a lot of this environmental awareness of the connection between people and land and, and health and um, well-being and the, the ecological need, you know, why traditional farming impact the earth? Um, why is organic? Why are those methodologies better for the earth? What fascinates me about organic gardening is, you know, the ways that you think about how to work in cooperation with the earth. My mother is interested in biodynamic farming. So it's thinking about what is this beetle going to do to help? The, you know, it's just very interesting. And then my first book was on the Civil War. Mm. And a lot of those images, those war images are about the destruction of the environment. A lot of those photographers were struggling with what modern warfare does to the environment. And they were just kind of sitting with that and making images of these trees. And so the first part of the exhibition has images like those, like George Barnard, where the photographers are really kind of meditating on environmental damage. It's an important one because that's where it gets codified. That's where the military says, use the environment as a tool for war. Mm -hmm. Devour the land, that is Sherman's phrase. Like he says, you know, after the march of the sea, he says, we've devoured the land. Oh. That's how we destroyed the South. We destroyed the land. So that's where the title comes from. And then the exhibition skips the 1970s as the environmental decade, as also this moment where people are rethinking landscape. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like new topographics, but it's also feminist artists, it's artists coming out of the civil rights movement, it's all kinds of artists are thinking differently about the land. Um, and they are recognizing militarism and they're recognizing oppression. And so it, it start, starts at that moment and moves on. Um, and so there are seven sections. Mm. The first one is called Devour the Land. The second one is called Silent Spring, which is this like 1970s moment, Rachel Carson, all that. And then Arming America is the biggest section where your work is, and that's about this kind of proliferation, the, the imprint. And it's two massive galleries where it's just kind of looking at where across the country is this imprint. Mm -hmm. And then the next section is called Slow Violence, and it looks at the particular kind of impact on communities of color sure. and how these are communities that are most impacted, sometimes urban, sometimes not, but are most impacted by these industries. And the next section is called Regeneration, and somewhat controversially, it's, it does look at sites where new ecological formations emerge, um, grasslands, they're preserved or they are created or parks are created. It, it tries to acknowledge that some of these spaces become something else. And the next section is called Other Battlefields, mm -hmm. where I say, what are other wars that are impacting our environment? So the border is an environmental crisis, as you know. Like, I mean, what's happening there with the people you know, trampling the soils, the machinery, the air traffic. I mean, all of that is an ecological crisis. It's like September 11th was, was, a, was a disaster. Um, 
And so it, it looks at prisons, some of our most polluted places in the country, the war on crime has produced these very polluted places. Right. Um, and then the last section is called resistance. And it's kind of an homage to everyday people who become, you know, activists and who try to do something. Yeah, those are the folks in the toxic tour. Is your mom still living? Yes, yes. I'd love yeah, this, to is, her. this is her house. <laughs> oh, okay. No, 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 because I, one of the things I told you I wanted to move here and live in the face of nature is also to garden. And I, I started out organically and yes, I've introduced biodynamic principles, but I chose one of the hardest places in the world to garden. You know, yes. it's 8,400 feet. We had a hailstorm that just devastated. It wipes out. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and in 15 minutes, boom, it's gone after you've, you know, given months. Uh, but, you know, the good thing about that is what a teacher nature can be and garden yes. can be. And uh, I knew deep in, in my soul that I needed, I needed to do this. So I do grow a good bit of my own food and share it. And um, it's, you know, it's helped me, uh, I, I suppose, get back to myself after doing that project and looking at the capacity of human beings to do what they do to one another, um, that there was the longest time, I've been here almost 27 years, but for the longest time, I couldn't imagine living anywhere else. And I still can't, but I, now I know I can leave, but I will always have to have that tie to the productive, beautiful mother. So that's interesting, though. It's like you need the evidence. It's like the photograph <laughs> was one form of evidence. And then like living it is another form of evidence that there's something else possible. True. Absolutely true. Hey, you're on that disconnect. And I'm sure you've explored this. Is, you know, we can look at what we might call a great misogyny towards Mother Earth and just this attitude that uh, we can take, we can use, we can abuse. And it's all OK because I can do it. And not really, you know, weaving into understanding that we truly are all in this together. And it is a limited resource. And we going back to that stewardship that we, you know, we can ensure that this earth continues to live. You know, Elon Musk yeah. is devastating some of my home world right now. He has his space spot down there right at Boca Chica where the Rio Grande meets the Gulf of Mexico. This is exactly it, that in the exhibition, a lot of women photographers, they were aware of this very early on, like before mm -hmm. there was environmental you yeah. know, photography in the 70s and their work was marginalized because they weren't making the big vistas. They weren't making, <laughs> you know, they weren't out in these places with these grand views, right. but they were making images of where they lived, of you know, places like Three Mile Island or making little books on Xerox machines. Mm -hmm. But because of that awareness, like this attitude toward the earth struck them as very familiar. <laughs> oh yeah, very much so. And, you know, a little bit of what you were touching on is, you know, these alliances that are formed, you know, we've come out of the women's movement, the civil rights movement, um, you know, that folded into the environmental movement. Um, Lois Gibbs from Love Canal came down to Carver Terrace in Texarkana and helped them organize to have their neighborhood bought out because it was built on top of a creosote treatment site. You know, again, people, you know, people of low economic means and power, political power, oh, well, you know, we'll build a subdivision over there. They won't mind, they'll just be happy to have a place to live. And that attitude is, uh, you know, the accountability thing. I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful where we, where we stand now with the new administration that you know action is being taken uh remediating you know a lot of these decisions the arctic wildlife you know decision just the other day i do worry about this country ping-ponging you know the polarities we go from obama to trump to and waste the, time another piece of that makita i think is people just some folks are just so trying to survive <laughs> just trying to get by and right. um I, you know, I, I'd say the majority of the people that were involved in the toxic tour were probably middle class, lower middle class, you know, but it, it's their tie to the land. You know, it's not only that they may be making their living from it, it's just that they have grown of it and from yes. it. Um, and that's what they have. That's what, yeah, they have. That's, that's, that's what they have. And there's this, you know, why don't people leave? Why don't they just move? <laughs> Well, in the whole buyout thing, I mean, you can you can go farther into looking at liability and how 
corporations and their lawyers have figured out, okay, we don't want to be sued. This is, we're just going to, you know, buy out all the homes that are next to, to our uh, refining factory, you know, facility down there in, in um, Texas City, for instance. But then there are also bribing communities, I call it that. Uh, Elon Musk, you know, after two of his rockets exploded, he, I think, gave $300,000 to the school districts in Cameron County, you know, very poor, Hispanic, actually Mexican, they are Hispanic, Mexican-American. Wow. Um, and you know, that was a, that was a strategy that has been used throughout time. You know, we'll give money to the little league or, you know, we'll build a tennis court, you know, whatever, but they do know that that creates quote unquote goodwill. Then maybe they'll, you know, they'll be over sight of what they, they're doing, um, that is very, very detrimental to, you know, not only the health of the land, but the health of the community. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. I hope I do hope that we meet in person. 